So now we will continue with the second part, which is the south wind. Uh, uh, so it is, it is a little bit shorter than the first part, so don't worry. Uh, uh, because the basic, is, uh, basic physics is exactly the same, it's just the, the instrument that is different. But it is actually measuring the same uh, radar cross section as the scatterometer. So why using uh, satellite side measuring? So first, because it's a uh, high spatial resolution, about uh, about few few meter resolution compared to few kilometers with a spectrometer. So yet then you can reach the coast without contamination, and you can have information very near the coast. So, so here, the star image where you see uh, the sea surface roughness. So. On the right, it's a, it's a land, so it's a Spain uh, coast, Spanish coast. Uh, and then you see uh, on the, here, it's a, it's an oil spill from a ship that sink, that sink here, and there is a lot of oil on the surface. And so the oil is, uh, is making the, <coughs> the water very flat. And then, as, as we see with the scatterometer, uh, if the water is flat, the the radar is sending something, but it's, uh, then it's going away without coming back. So that's why it, uh, the backscatter, the radar cross-section is uh, almost uh, zero. So it's black, uh, it's a low, low intensity. And so you can follow the presence of oil on the surface. You see that it's very high resolution. If you have a scatterometer, you, you, you will have only one value for all this. So compared to scatterometer, the, the coverage is a little bit less. So it's uh, only 500 kilometers and only on one side, not on two sides. And also the visit time is, uh, is larger. So you have over the same area, you have maybe one image every, uh, every two days or something like that. So of course, if you have more satellites, then uh, you have more frequent revisit. So the, the main difference between uh, scatterometer and SAR is uh, the antenna. So with the uh, with the classic uh, antenna, the resolution is proportional uh, to the inverse of the length of the antenna. So that means that. Uh, with the antenna 10 meter, which is already a big antenna for a satellite. So you, you cannot put a, a very, very big antenna on a satellite. You need to launch it. Uh, in fact, you get a resolution of the surface for a typical uh, orbit at uh, 800 kilometers. So what? You get 5 kilometer resolution, which is better than, uh, a little bit better than scatterometer not very high resolution. So, so for instance, scatterometer, their antenna is the size of about uh, maybe 3 meter, 2 meter. That's why they have resolution of 12.5 kilometers. So. But in the case of the SAR, in fact, you, you call it synthetic aperture radar because uh, we synthesize artificially a larger antenna by having the, the antenna to move uh, to move and to still look at the same point on the surface. And in fact, we, we are using the, the signal of this uh, antenna all along the, the motion. So the, the antenna can travel uh, with the speed of the satellite, of course, and observe the same uh, the same point of the surface for a few, uh, a couple, maybe it's one second. But within this one second, he's looking at the surface with different angles. And with a, uh, with a, uh, by using the, the frequency information inside the signal, knowing that uh, the part of the signal that uh, comes in front of the antenna has higher frequency 
and the part that goes uh, on the back because of the Doppler shift, then you, uh, you, can, uh, you can come back to a much higher resolution by using the integral of all these observations. And, th and then it is like if you have uh, an antenna of, uh, let's say, uh, 5 kilometers, even with, uh, starting with a physical antenna that is only 10 meters. And then with this synthetic aperture processing, you can, you can obtain a resolution down to about the, the size of the antenna, which is uh, 10 meters. So then, with high resolution uh, backscatter image, so what you observe at the surface is also uh, over the sea is, uh, is a sea surface roughness. And how does the, the same image observe local wind? Local wind, you see uh, some area with brighter, some area uh, darker. Usually the wind is stronger in the the brighter area, where you have stronger uh, backscatter, because uh, as we see, it depends highly on the, on the wind speed. So if you see some, uh, some wind sticks, which is uh, like small bounds aligned with the wind direction, because the wind is not exactly constant on the sea surface, and there is some, uh, some modulation uh, which are aligned with the wind direction. In this case, on the left part, you, you can see some uh, some lines that, uh, that are aligned with the new direction. You can also observe some uh, wind pattern very close to the coast. So here there is no more limitation near next to, to the coast. And you see that, for example, the land breeze, so the, you see the, the thermal wind uh, at night when the land is colder than the, than the ocean. Then you have a uh, land breeze that the wind is blowing from the land to the ocean with some acceleration very uh, in some, uh, depending on the local uh, topography on the coast. And so you see that you have higher wind in some small area and lower wind near the coast with a very, much, very detailed uh, and, uh, and high resolution uh, variability that you couldn't see with the scatterometer. The scatterometer will probably start its first measurement uh, where the land breeze is already uh, gone. So, how the star also we look at the catabatic wind is also wind uh, that, uh, that blow from the, from the land to, to the ocean and stop at some point. So, this is uh, why here you have. Uh, high backscatter because you have strong wind and then stop. And here it's uh, black because it's very low wind. Just, uh, just after that the wind stop. It's typical of uh, some uh, catapathic uh, wind phenomena. So also in the, in the presence of uh, atmospheric front, you see very clear delimitation of the front with a little bit calm wind in front and a uh, much stronger wind behind the front. And, and you can see also some, some rain cell, the typical rain cell on the, on the, on the SAR uh, backscatter image. It's looking like a, like a volcano, in fact, like the crater of a volcano. So it's, uh, it's like you, you have some, uh, some kind of if you are looking on the overland on the volcano, it will almost look like, uh, like that. So you have bright on one side and dark on the other side. Here also another rain. So. And the, the reason is uh, because when there is rain, the, there is a, a, a down, downwind drop to the surface. And then when the wind arrives to the surface, it starts to diverge. So it means that uh, will accelerate the background wind on one side and decelerate the background wind on the other side. That's why you, you have uh, this uh, inside the red cell you have one side brighter and one side darker. So you can 
also observe uh, oceanic, oceanic phenomena like, like uh, internal wave. So, but this is the uh, interaction between wave and current. I will not go in details, but it has a signature from the surface because it modifies the surface. And you see a uh, signature of this internal wave here from the surface and uh, on the surface. Because of the high resolution, you are able to, to see all these details. So when there is a strong storm like polar low, you, you can see a very detailed uh, boundary of the, of the atmospheric front, even with, uh, with some wave on the front. You see some oscillation uh, of the scatter on the front here. Very detailed, very detailed. Of course, with a, with a low wind at the center. And, uh, it's not so clear in this picture, but you have a signature of atmospheric convective cell. That means that uh, you have uh, a lot of uh, variation between uh, dark and, uh, and the bright area everywhere. And this is uh, a little bit like rain cell, but uh, very small and, uh, and, and covering the whole surface. So very detailed uh, signature. So the SAR, how many satellites today? So it's like scatterometry. We have a set of satellites uh, that are flying and that will be flying. The number is, uh, is quite larger than the scatterometer. So right now you have uh, Radarsat 1, Radarsat 2 from the Canadian uh, Space Agency. You have one uh, Indian, two uh, German satellites, and one Italian. And you see that they are not all in the same uh, frequency. Like the scatterometer, though, some are using C band, which is less contaminated by rain, and some are using uh, X band. So X band is more contaminated by rain. The, the wavelength is, uh, I think, uh, about one or two centimeters. But with the X band, you can obtain higher resolution imagery. So for some application, you need, a, let's say, one meter resolution, and then you, you are using X-band satellite. But for oceanography, uh, uh, the resolution you can get with a C-band, about 10 meters, is, uh, is, is really enough for, uh, to look at, uh, at atmospheric phenomena, so it's, uh, it's So this is satellite to be launched in the, in the future. Star satellites, so you see there is quite, uh, quite uh, a number. So I pay attention that there is uh, one launch in 2005 by, uh, by a Russian uh, Rosenbromet. Uh, it's bound, and, uh, but there will, be, uh, there will be some launch in later this year and, uh, and next year. So this year, supposed to be uh, ALOS 2, which is launched, and uh, Sentinel-1. I don't know really what is the plan for the other, but these two uh, are supposed to be launched uh, this year. So just uh, to give uh, the characteristic uh, of the SAR orbit, it's very similar to the scatterometer. The altitude is 800 km. Equator uh, crossing time is around 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. like the spectrometer. So some of them have uh, only uh, horizontal polarization, some of them have uh, uh, horizontal and vertical and cross polarization, like the more recent and advanced one, like Padarsat 2. So, Unlike the scatterometer, the, the SAR have uh, different modes of operation that are all uh, mutually exclusive. Either they, they, they choose to have a very high resolution image but a small uh, image, or they can choose to have a very wide uh, image but with a lower resolution. It depends on the application, on the area over the globe. But for, for oceanic, oceanographic uh, and atmospheric uh, 
uh, application like uh, SARWIND, uh, of course, the, the wider, uh, the wide coverage and the lower resolution is, uh, is better. No. So you see, uh, for uh, oceanic and atmospheric application, we look for uh, scansar wide and scansar narrow, which are effectively 300 and 500 kilometers wide. Resolution about uh, Sentinel One is uh, the, the next uh, the next SAR that will be launched by the European Space Agency, and so it's important to mention that uh, data distribution is uh, free and open, which is not always the case for SAR. For, for scattermatter is always uh, free and open, but not always for SAR. But this one from uh, launch should be launched uh, at the end of the year and uh, will be available so will we'll be able to be used here also uh, in the lab. So uh, and the, the characteristics are, are also uh, similar to previous uh, SARS. So it's a C bond and they will have uh, copolarization and postpolarization. So they will still have uh, four different operating modes. So, uh, but uh, this time, uh, the, the different modes will be selected in advance, and probably uh, over ocean it will be one mode. Over, so over land it will be uh, interferometric mode. Over ocean it will be wide coverage for coastal region and. and uh, very far from the coast, uh, it will be wave mode with a small image, just to measure wave, not wind. Because the wind variability uh, and the interest of having SAR wind is mostly for uh, coastal application because for, uh, when you are very far from the coast, uh, you don't need to have the wind with uh, that much resolution most of the time. Because the variability is not as, uh, as strong as the coastal application. That's why this SAR will operate in a wide scope of coastal region and with a small wave mode far from the coast. And this is the characteristic of the coverage. So for the ocean and atmospheric uh, study, it will be this extra wide source with 50 meter resolution, most likely that uh, would be good. So this is just to, uh, to show uh, the different uh, choice of uh, operating mode. So you can have a fine resolution, 8 meter, and, but you have only a small uh, image. But if you want to have uh, monitoring of a full uh, basin, for instance, you need to have white source. So for wind monitoring, you need to have uh, another white source. So, when extracting a wind from the from the SAR, we are we are averaging uh, the pixels, so we don't we don't obtain the wind at the same resolution as the as the SAR image. We go down to one kilometer resolution, which is uh, already uh, a lot better than the better resolution than scatterometer. Accuracy is uh, similar to the accuracy of wind. From scatterometer. So here is a scatterometer uh, wind. So in this case, it's uh, I think it's, it's 25 km resolution. But just to, uh, to show you the difference uh, with the SAR wind, uh, so you, you see that you, you can really uh, get closer to the coast and and. Uh, have much higher detailed description of the wind uh, near the coast. Because as you see, when you are far from the coast, you are most likely large scale, but when you are close to the coast, that's where you start to have the small scale variation of wind and when you are interested by the, by the sound. So here you, you see clearly acceleration and, uh, of wind and the uh, and the sheltering by the coastal sheltering and coastal acceleration. The 
typical of uh, meteorology, but this is clearly seen by the uh, So this is just uh, also uh, another uh, idea when using the star wind to uh, assess the, the mean wind, for, for instance, for, uh, for offshore wind farm installation. If you do it with a scatterometer, we will get this type of uh, map with, uh, with this resolution. And when you do it with the star, you can really uh, get much more detail on the coast and see that uh, in some area, you have uh, the same wind from the scatterometer, same, but then uh, it can be very different from the star. And uh, if you want to install uh, or to decide where, where to, to install uh, this uh, offshore wind field, it is interesting to use this uh, star wind information. So, one of the other interests of, the, of using SAR is to, when you want to locate uh, atmospheric front. So, in fact, uh, atmospheric front, as you see on the SAR image, uh, the, the, white, uh, the white line, dashed line, is, uh, is completely different from the location of the front you have in the atmospheric model. And so, it is uh, easy to, to pick with the uh, Two different atmospheric models, but none of them has a front position at the right place. Also, in, in, in case of uh, hurricanes, uh, you see that the, the SAR can also help locate the position of the eye much more precisely than, uh, than with, uh, what the model can, uh, can, can tell, usually. And, and then you can uh, when we retrieve the, 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 the wind from the star, you see that uh, you can really uh, obtain a wind field that is uh, at the, of course, the height at the, at the correct position. So wind strength, as I was saying uh, here, is typical of uh, when you have strong wind, and here you see that uh, a strong wind, you can capture this variability. So, uh, the, the wind stakes is associated to a strong variability in the wind speed. And uh, the same as the, the, the lee wave. So, this is an atmospheric wave generated by the wind over the topography. And you see that uh, on the south image, uh, it has a strong impact on the backscatter image. And it translates into a, a strong uh, change in the, in the wind speed, which will not be seen also by, uh, by model or most of the time or, or, or set of motor. And, and this can be a change in the wind of more than 100%. So this is a significant uh, change. So catabatic wind and sea wind here, it's a uh, sea breeze. But I already showed that, that, uh, that uh, this, uh, the detail of this, uh, of this circulation is, uh, is unique and given by the sound. So what, uh, what, what is also uh, interesting with the SAR is that not only you get uh, information on the, on the radar backscatter, so the, the intensity of the echo, but also you can measure the, the change of frequency between the emitted uh, pulse and the received uh, signal. So you could do it also with scatterometer, but uh, the bandwidth of the, the scatterometer is too large to be able to uh, retrieve properly this information. Only with, uh, with SAR, because of the, of the SAR processing uh, and the narrow narrow beam that you have, you, can be, you are able to, to measure this, uh, this change of frequency quite precisely. And we will see that uh, this can be very helpful also, also in the, for, for, for wind retrieval. So it's another, for, another parameter to constrain the problem. So for instance, here, uh, this is a hurricane. So on, on the right, you see the hurricane wind. And on the left, what you see is the, the Doppler shift. So it's uh, negative uh, when it's uh, purple and positive when it's uh, yellow or red. So you see that you have a change of sign in this quantity when you cross the when the wind is, uh, is changing.
And so this, is, this can really help to, uh, to locate the eye and the wind direction because this is very sensitive to wind direction and we immediately see from, uh, from, from this uh, backcatter image of the another cyclone, another hurricane in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, you see that the wind is stronger because it's brighter and you see that there is a small black dot which is uh, the eye of the, the cyclone. But on the Doppler sheet, we immediately uh, locate the eye because uh, there is a very strong change of wind direction. Because uh, over the eye, the, the wind is uh, both turning and changing direction 180. And by using this information, we, uh, we have very precise wind direction, as I will show uh, later the improvement, on the, on the reflected uh, wind from the south. So on the right is a uh, Wind from the so in fact, here is just uh, just to show that the Doppler shift is very dependent on the wind direction. So Doppler shift is uh, here between minus 50 and plus 50, and here you have the, the wind direction. So uh, when the wind is facing the radar, it's positive, and uh, when the wind is perpendicular to the radar, it's zero. And when it's uh, going away, it's, uh, it's negative. So this is, uh, this is how we use uh, the, the Doppler shift to, to, to constrain very much the, the wind direction. So here again, we don't see uh, really this, uh, this change in wind in the, in the wind speed if you, if, you don't use, uh, if you don't use the Doppler shift. But here, you, you clearly see uh, the change direction uh, just uh, immediately if you look at the Doppler information. So again here if you see that uh, the Doppler information is really uh, important. So here what I forget to say is uh, this star wind is retrieved without using this uh, Doppler information. It's using, using the same uh, technique as the scattermetry. And I, I will show uh, the difference of using this Doppler compared to not using this. So this is a case where you have a uh, backscatter back image with a front, atmospheric front. So obviously a stronger wind on the, on the left. So this is a atmospheric model wind at low resolution. So which will, uh, which will give also uh, the large scale uh, corrective. But here, when you retrieve the wind speed from the star without using Doppler, you will see that you use uh, the, the wind direction from the model as an a priori, and then you will see that the wind, this makes you the wind turn, like here at 90 degrees much before the front. Well, we, we, we all know that the wind will uh, turn at the front. And, and you see clearly the front, the, the atmospheric front and the, and the wind speed uh, intensity because it's much stronger on one side and the other. So this is not realistic at all. And now by introducing the, the Doppler shift in the, in, in the retrieval, so in fact we, we just add a new constraint on the, on the Doppler shift. So uh, the, the way we, uh, we retrieve the wind with SAR from the, the, the GMF, which is the, the model function that relates the wind to the cross-section, it's by the minimization of the function. And in this minimization, we can add a term that is uh, sensitive to, uh, to the Doppler. And when we add the Doppler, so on the left is uh, what the minimization we do usually, so to find the minimum of this function. Then we add uh, a constraint to the Doppler, and when we, we combine the two, so this is, uh, this is how, to, how to constrain the problem. So if we use, sorry, if we use only the, the cross-section here, these are all the possibilities. So when we want to minimize the function, so we look for the minimum, 
but sometimes it can have several minima. You see? So in fact, uh, you may be wrong if you don't choose the, the correct one. So when you the, the win streaks it also can, can also be a, another constraint because as you say, as I as I was showing uh, in the image you, you can identify the wind direction just by the the modulation of the image. So, and this is another constraint. But still, by using this, uh, you are left with uh, sometimes you still have uh, some, uh, in some in some wind direction. You still have two possibilities when you minimize the function. And when you add the Doppler, you see that in most of the case you reduce the uh, uncertainty. So in this case, you have two solutions like 0 and 180 and by adding the Doppler you are left with only one solution and so in fact you, you reduce a lot the ambiguity on the direction by using this new, uh, this new information so the black is when you combine Doppler, wind streaks and, and cross section and so at the end you see that you get uh, most of the time you get only one solution except for the last uh, the last situation where the wind is facing the radar, uh, it's perpendicular to the radar. And then you can have an a priori on the numerical wave prediction model that will, uh, that will allow you, for example, in the last case, to solve the, the final ambiguity. So just using the model to, to know uh, if the, the direction of the wind is uh, this direction or, or the opposite. So this was the total, and, and after we just need to take the minimum of the function, there is only one minimum. So it's, uh, it's easy to convert on the good solution. So here you see the, again this case, where you have the, the bad scatter image, the Doppler image. So of course you see that the Doppler is changing strongly at the front, because the wind direction is, is supposed to change completely at, at this location. Then this will constrain the, the wind direction to change and uh, when you retrieve. It. So this is uh, on the left without uh, using Doppler and you see that the wind direction is not turning at the right place. But when you use Doppler shift immediately the wind direction is changing where it should. And then this is uh, this is really uh, much better that you get from SA then uh, if you don't use uh, the Doppler information. In some complex situation like this, you need to use uh, the Doppler shift. So you see there are, there are still uh, a lot of improvements uh, that are ongoing, starting from the same, uh, from the basic measurement from the satellite to get to the, to the true uh, wind field uh, even, even with the SA. So this is zoom, where we immediately uh, see that uh, uh, with uh, taking into account all information, not only uh, the cross-section we got from the scatterometer, but also the blur, uh, we have much more realistic uh, wind uh, field at the end. Okay, and last, uh, before uh, I finish, so this is a uh, uh, wind, uh, star wind over uh, Bay of Finland. And, uh, so what is typical is that when there is ice, we use an ice flag. And here, black means ice flag. And ice flag we get from a low resolution uh, uh, passive radiometer. And you see that uh, it doesn't look like the ice that we have on the Bay of Finland. It's just a very low resolution. And in fact, here, we want to know why you have a very strong uh, wind because when it's red it's supposed to be uh, 20 meters per second and when it's, uh, when it's purple it's uh, maybe 50 meters per second or 30 meters per second so this, is, this looks uh, a bit strange at the, at the wind speed but if you look at the max scatter image you immediately see that this is ice because ice is a uh, about to melt in this case, so this is in, uh, in March of, of last year, and, and you see that clearly uh, this is ice, and this is not. Uh, you cannot uh, retrieve the, the wind from SA when there is ice. So you would need to have a much much better discrimination between water and ice if you want to have a reliable wind field at the end.
Otherwise, you will provide uh, information that is not going to speed, which is just uh, a wrong use of uh, ice. Uh, ice information. Well, on the left, on the west part of the image, it clearly uh, corresponds to the wind with sheltering on the, on the coast, so it, and, and, and then when it reaches the other coast, there is no sheltering because it's, it's onshore wind. So the rest is very consistent, but we should always pay attention to, uh, to ice and better uh, and develop better ice flag for sour wind. So uh, this, is, this is a good subject for this uh, laboratory to work. Finally, this is just a reference uh, where you can find an uh, example of star wind. So there, is, there is some on the scene tool developed at uh, Solab. But on other websites, you can also uh, find uh, example of wind from star. And also, there is a workshop uh, where you have a lot of uh, presentation on uh, different uh, application of Sarwin and, and, uh, and methodology to refine uh, the extraction of Sarwin also uh, that, uh, that, has, that have been last year in June and, uh, and they are uh, 